All right, so this is the first of uh, four lectures, uh, and we're going to follow this general theme of having sort of a brief lecture. This is probably one of the longer ones, uh, and then there will be some slides uh, introducing the tutorial, and then we'll actually go through the tutorial, <coughs> and we'll kind of back and forth like that, uh, so that there's a mix of uh, lecture and sort of live tutorial activities kind of interspersed. Uh, so these, again, the preamble slides with the Creative Commons license. Uh, module 1, so this is really an introduction to RNA sequencing itself with not too much emphasis on analysis, and then we're going to get more and more into sort of the analysis aspects as we go. Um, learning objectives of this course overall, so we're going to have, as I said, four uh, modules. The first one will be an introduction. The second one, we're going to really dig into the details of RNA sequence alignment. Uh, and visualization of RNA-seq data. The third one will be expression, differential expression, and the fourth one will be ice form discovery and alternative expression. We're going to do the first two today and three and four tomorrow. Um, and then each of these modules is going to have a series of tutorials. Uh, and the uh, goal of these tutorials is to provide a working example of an RNA-seq analysis pipeline. So the idea is you can take this home and use it to set up the pipeline that you're going to use to process your own data in your own lab. Uh, for the purposes of the in educational instruction that you receive here, uh, we have the goal of that this should run in a reasonable amount of time with modest computer resources. Uh, you will probably need greater computer resources to process larger data sets when you get back to your own lab, but the, the, de the data sets we're using here are really sort of test sized so that things kind of uh, roll along quickly. Uh, and the whole tutorial uh, modules are meant to be self-contained and self-explanatory and portable. So they don't, there's nothing about them that means that they will only work here. You should be able to take these home and run them on any uh, Linux or uh, Mac machine uh, or Windows where you log into uh, a Linux machine. We're going to log into the, into the Amazon cluster, but you could just log into some other server uh, that you have available at your university. Specific learning objectives for Module 1. So we're going to do an introduction to the theory and practice of RNA sequencing analysis, starting with sort of the background rationale for sequencing RNA in the first place, some of the, cha some of the challenges that are really specific to RNA-seq analysis that might not be uh, uh, encountered doing, when you're doing DNA sequence analysis, uh, some of the general goals and themes of RNA-seq analysis workflows. There's a infinite number of ways you can do RNA-seq analysis, but there are some general themes that are shared uh, across these different approaches. <coughs> We're going to review some common technical questions that come up uh, in RNA-seq experiments, uh, and you're, wel you're welcome to ask additional questions, but we've kind of just added in questions that get asked every year uh, just to address them at the outset. We'll go over how to get help outside of this course, uh, and then we'll do a brief introduction to the first tutorial. So before we go any further, oh, two screens, um, this is sort of the really high level biological introduction to RNA sequencing uh, that's kind of a good idea to start with. Uh, we could probably spend the next hour talking about sort of the details and implications of this slide, uh, but just briefly, it's, this is a summary of the central dogma, uh, basically describing how information uh, is transmitted from uh, the genomic DNA level to uh, the protein level. Uh, so starting at the top here, we have a depiction of a double-stranded genomic DNA template in very cartoonish uh, and not-to-scale format, uh, showing a, a promoter region and a hypothetical gene with three exons uh, and two introns. Uh, and then there's various features annotated on this uh, gene, uh, such as a transla translation initiation codon uh, and a stop codon, a polyadenylation site. Uh, this thing... Uh, gets transcribed uh, by a polymerase uh, into a, an RNA molecule and it gets polyadenylated. So this happens uh, in, the, in human anyways, it happens in the nucleus. Um, and you wind up with a single-stranded pre-mRNA molecule, uh, which still has the introns in place uh, in between the exons. Uh, and then what's shown here are various features that allow uh, splicing of this molecule to occur. So you have uh, donor sites and acceptor sites. We're going to talk a bit more about those in Module 4. <coughs> you got your introns. Uh, 
uh, and your exons. And then there are various other regulatory features such as exonic splicing enhancers and silencers and intronic splicing enhancers and silencers. Uh, and there's a very complicated uh, splicing machinery that recognizes all of these features uh, and very specifically removes the introns and splices the exons together to give you a mature mRNA molecule, which is what's depicted here. Uh, this thing, once it's polyadenylated, gets exported to the cytoplasm where translation into protein will occur if it's a, a protein coding transcript. Uh, and then uh, that will give you a protein sequence which will be folded uh, and other post-translational modifications may occur. This often is what we're interested in in terms of biology. Uh, if we could sequence these things directly uh, and understand their structure in some kind of high throughput fashion, we would probably just do that. Um, but the technology is really not available to do that in a high throughput fashion. Uh, most proteomics technology is still really low to medium throughput. Uh, but we can study this thing in a very high throughput fashion by RNA-seq, and that, so that's really what we're going to be talking about over the next few days. But it's important to remember that RNA-seq isn't really sequencing these things directly. Uh, so there's a few uh, sort of nuances to what's really going on. Uh, one is that we're not actually sequencing RNA. All of the sequencing technologies that are available today actually sequence DNA. Uh, so in order to sequence these things, we need to convert them to cDNA. Uh, and it might be double-stranded or single-stranded cDNA, but it will be DNA. Uh, and then we're not sequencing full-length uh, transcripts. We're usually uh, converting this into cDNA and fragmenting it into smaller pieces or fragmenting the RNA and then converting those pieces into cDNA. But either way, uh, you're starting with something that is potentially quite large, and then you're sequencing little pieces of it. Uh, and then we're going to try to assemble those pieces back together and infer something about the structure um, of the RNA that was actually there. But it's really important to remember that there's a, potentially a lot of inference going on there. Uh, and there is a whole field of people developing algorithms to make those inferences. Uh, but it's a very difficult problem, and you really have to keep in mind that um, even though you may be given a prediction of a 2,000 base pair uh, RNA with a particular structure, that was really kind of assembled from uh, pieces of information, and it isn't guaranteed to be correct. <clears throat> so the sort of the, the amount that, that this sort of uh, caveat uh, is important will depend on your species and how big the RNAs tend to be. Uh, so in human... Um, we have the situation that's depicted here. So, for so let's consider just a really simple experimental design, uh, and this is what we're going to, the data that we're going to be analyzing the tutorials will be based on this scenario where we have just two samples of interest. Uh, in this case, um, a colon tumor sample and a matched normal sample from adjacent colon tissue. Uh, and from those two tissues, we isolated RNA, which is what's depicted here. Uh, the scale here is shown as 250 basis. So you can see that these RNAs are on the order of 500 to 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 bases in size, which is uh, representative of what they would be for human. Uh, these, from these RNAs, we're going to generate cDNA fragments, uh, size select those often, uh, add linkers to them, and then we have these small fragments of cDNA uh, with sequencing adapters on either side. Uh, they tend to be in the range of 250 to 4 or 500 base pairs in size. <clears throat> these fragments, all of these molecules are going to be flowed across an Illumina flow cell. And in this case, the data came from the Illumina platform, uh, which is depicted here. So this is a, about the size of a microscope slide. It has eight channels, uh, and each of those is sort of a freeform space that you flow molecules across. Uh, and then the sequencing happens in cycles of ATCG, where you image this. Uh, flow cell, uh, and you uh, observe the incorporation of each of the four bases, <clears throat> and you keep cycling through, and you build up uh, RNA sequences from that. The output of this machine is going to be hundreds of millions of paired end reads. So really what we're going to get is a, a short sequence at the end of each fragment. So we started with these fragments, and we're going to read in from each end. Uh, and the data we're going to look at today is actually 100 bases in from the left and 100 bases in from the right. And then depending on how big the fragment is, there's some unknown sequence in the middle. Uh, and that's just one of the, the many inferences that we're going to have to make is sort of inferring that when we map these two reads and we identify them, we're kind of guessing that the sequence in between is what we think it is based on the reference genome. Uh, so this is really the currency of all RNA sequence analysis is these paired reads. 
Uh, and what we're going to do is take those reads, map them to a combination of the genome, transcriptome, and predicted exon-exon junctions from uh, known transcript sequences. Uh, and then all of this is going to be fed into a variety of downstream analyses. And that little box is really what we're going to be, this, this process is really what we're going to spend the next two days really digging into. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so the question was, or the comment was, that this is really so far focused on coding RNAs. What about non coding RNAs? So it, it is a bit of an oversimplification the way I have depicted this. Um, these mature mRNA molecules, in this case, it's assumed that they're protein coding, uh, but uh, depending on exactly how you isolate your RNA, they don't necessarily need to be protein coding. Uh, if you don't do a poly A selection, uh, they may or may not be poly A adenylated. Um, really what you're going to get out of an RNA-seq experiment, the way most people do it is sequences for all of the coding and non-coding RNAs that are above a certain size. For microRNAs and other small RNA species, usually you will have to do a separate library construction uh, protocol. Uh, so most labs will to kind of take a divide and conquer strategy where they say do what is considered sort of classic RNA sequencing is everything that's say 300 bases or larger uh, and then there's a variety of other sort of custom techniques for creating libraries to sequence the small RNAs uh, and most people will do at least two. They'll have a small RNA or a microRNA pipeline and they'll have an everything else pipeline uh, and we're going to, most of what's considered today will be the sort of classic RNA-seq, which is everything that's a few hundred bases or larger. A lot of the analysis techniques will be the same, but there are certainly for very small RNAs, you will need pro probably a dedicated RNA microRNA pipeline that does alignment slightly differently and does sort of summarization of the data in a different way. Yes. Yes. Classic yes, although there are some sort of nuances to that that we'll go through. It. In particular, if they're non-coding and they're not polyadenylated, then you would want to make sure that you didn't do a poly A selection. Uh, and there's a, a whole galaxy of RNA-seq kits for making the libraries. Some of them include poly A selection. Some of them include priming off of oligo-DT primers and some of them don't. So you want to really think about the details of the RNA-seq kit that you choose to make sure that it's going to cover uh, the types of RNAs that you're interested in. Uh, but there are some sort of very holistic approaches that don't do poly sec selection that use only random primers and then really the main limitation will just be the size of the RNA. Everything else should come through. Um. So if one were to do for really small microRNAs, you're probably going to want to, you might use the same aligner or the same underlying aligner. You, you, might, you might do okay with Top Hat. Probably you're better off just to use Bowtie, which is what Top Hat uses for its alignment. Um, and in some ways, the align alignment is sort of conceptually sim simpler for microRNAs because a lot of what a lot of the fanciness of the top hat alignment algorithm is trying to figure out where splice junctions are, so where the exons start and end, and what where the intron is interspersed, and that doesn't really apply to microRNAs. So it's kind of a wasted uh, search when you're trying to do that with microRNAs. So I would say you you better off to go to uh, a different alignment strategy for microRNAs. Any more questions? Yes, uh, a lot of non-model organisms don't have very good reference genomes or predictions of transcripts or sometimes drug genomes or anything. Are we going to be doing any de novo assembly of RNAs in that? We will not, unfortunately, have time for de novo assembly. It's one of several topics that we would love to cover if we had more time. Maybe if this was like a three or four day workshop or we may have a separate workshop in the future. Um, we will make some recommendations of tools for assembly. 
Uh, so there's a couple slides that are sort of like, what if my experimental situation doesn't match what we're doing here? Um, but it, it's, yeah, the assembly is, transcriptome assembly is really a difficult problem, and it's difficult to do justice in a, you know, in just a few minutes, so we would need like a whole module dedicated to that. So a lot of what we're doing here is predicated on the fact that we have a good reference with good passage already. Yeah, I mean, good is a highly, you know, subjective term, but the well, assumption for these tools is that you have some reference to work not. with. Yeah, I mean, the better the reference is, the better your results will be. But you definitely need some kind of reference to use the tool chain that we're going to use today. Uh, I think we're going to talk about that on an upcoming slide. But there are basically two strategies. One is to positively, positively select for things that are polyadenylated. And since ribosomal RNA is not polyadenylated, it gets sort of washed away. The other is to positively select for the ribosomal RNA and then to keep everything else. And that both of those approaches are quite widely used, um, and they ha both have their pluses and minuses. Um, and there are sort of other strategies that are a little bit more indirect. So there are some library construction strategies that just attempt to remove very abundant species, which ribosomal RNAs are by far the most abundant uh, in your RNA sample. Um, so I would say those are kind of the three the three strategies, and there are kits that use each of those different strategies. <clears throat> capture, yes. There's also, you can do like an exome capture of your RNA library to enrich for actual genes and to try to wash away the ribosomal species. Oh, and you can do combinations of these things as well. So your question is how to eliminate genomic DNA contamination? So your sample will be contaminated with genomic DNA. There is no will, will it or will it not. The question is how much. Um, and it will also be contaminated with unprocessed RNAs if you're dealing with a eukaryotic species. Again, there's not a question of will or will not. It's just a matter of how much. Um, and one of the ways that people assess the level of that is to use uh, one of the tools that we're going to talk about. Uh, so Picard has a RNA QC component that summarizes how many reads align two exons across exon-exon boundaries um, within introns, within UTRs, in non-genic space, and in uh, ribosomal or mitochondrial uh, genes. And you can use the sort of breakdown of those categories to assess how much your reads align to real transcripts versus to places where you don't expect a gene. Or to introns. Or, and you can get a sense of how much genomic DNA contamination you have by looking at the number, the proportion of reads that align to regions of the genome that don't have annotated transcripts. All right, uh, so a couple quick s sort of background rationale slides. Why would we sequence RNA in the first place versus genomic DNA? And this is really for sort of the genomic crowd, so probably none of you need to be convinced. Uh, but just uh, to quickly run through some of the rationales any anyways, um, one of them is uh, you study RNA because you're interested in doing functional studies. Uh, so there are experimental scenarios where the genome may actually be constant, but some experimental condition has uh, some effect on gene expression. So for example, you might have cell lines where you have uh, a drug-treated and untreated condition. You may have a, a model organism uh, where you've created a genetic variant of that model organism. So you, for example, uh, some gene knockout mouse, for example. Um, some molecular features can really only be observed at the RNA level, so you can try to predict things like alternative isoforms, fusion transcripts, and RNA editing from the genome, but it's really, really hard and not very accurate. If you sequence the RNA directly, you have a much better uh, method for interrogating those things. 
Um, predicting transcript sequence that's actually expressed from the genome sequence is extremely difficult. A lot of people used to s develop methods to do this when genome sequencing was prevalent, but before it was practical to do a lot of RNA sequencing. So people would try to predict what will the alternative splicing or RNA editing pattern look like by studying the genome sequence. Now that we can sequence RNA, we can bypass that very uh, problematic and inaccurate uh, method by just interrogating the RNA directly. Uh, when you combine RNA sequencing with DNA sequencing, sometimes this allows you to do interesting things like you can interpret mutations that you've detected uh, at the DNA level, but you don't know what their effect might be. Uh, so for example, you might uh, study regulatory mutations that affect what RNA isoforms are expressed and how much. So these could be splice site mutations, promoter mutations, mutations in exon uh, splicing signals. Uh, and then you can also use it to pr prioritize protein coding somatic mutations. So this is something that's done in cancer a lot, where you have uh, mutations in genes that are expressed versus mutations in genes that are silent, silent or actually silenced by the mutation. Uh, so you might uh, have a simple breakdown where you say if the gene is not expressed and a mutation in that gene might be less interesting. Uh, if the gene is expressed but only the wild type allele, this could su suggest a loss of function mutation. Uh, and conversely, if the mutant allele is preferentially expressed, this might be a good uh, candidate drug target because you know you have a somatic mutation in the genome, the gene is being expressed, and for some uh, reason it's being preferentially expressed. Uh, and in cancer, that those are good candidates for driver mutations. So there's a lot of challenges that are particular to RNA sequencing, some of which we've already come up in the questions, uh, but we'll just uh, go through all these, and if you have further questions, just stop me. Uh, so one is the sample. Uh, so this is something that's always a, a question with any kind of sample you're interrogating. Is it pure? Uh, do you have enough of that sample? What is the quality? So is it degraded? Uh, and this is particularly a concern with RNA that can easily be degraded. Uh, and a lot of our time in RNA-seq analysis is spent assessing RNA quality and trying to deal with the problems of the instability of RNA compared to DNA. Uh, another problem that I already alluded to is that RNAs consist of small exons that are separated by large introns in many species, uh, especially uh, in the mammals. Uh, so you've got these huge introns and relatively small exons. The reads are coming from the exons, so this creates a mapping challenge. We're trying to map our reads back to the genome, and you have some sequence that hits an exon, and then it spans across a huge intron into another exon, so that creates sort of a search space problem where we have some of our sequence hitting an exon and then the, the remainder of the sequence is mapping potentially 100,000 bases downstream uh, where the intron ends and the next exon begins. Another problem that you have in RNA that you don't have in DNA is that the relative abundance of RNAs vary wildly. So in, in contrast to the genome where you expect approximately even coverage across the genome uh, of a diploid organism, in RNA, you do not have this expectation at all. Uh, so the relative abundance of one RNA compared to another RNA might vary wildly, say 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 7 orders of magnitude. Uh, and this is important because RNA sequencing works by random sampling. So we're not directing where, where we get these reads in any way. We have this pool of RNA, and we're basically shotgun sequencing it. We have almost, basically no control over what sequences get generated. Uh, and the amount of sequence that we get from any particular RNA is really dependent on how highly expressed that RNA is. So when we start sequencing, we tend to see re a lot of reads for highly expressed genes, and these consume the majority of our reads. For lowly expressed genes, we might have to produce a ton of sequence before we start to see any sequences from those really lowly expressed genes. So if we're interested in those genes, uh, that creates a problem. And this is sort of related to the high expression of ribosomal and mitochondrial genes, where you basically just wind up sequencing these things to death, and the gene that you're really interested in, it takes a lot of data before you start to get reads hitting that gene. Uh, sort of another related issue is that RNAs come in a wide range of sizes, so we've also alluded to this already. Uh, we've got small RNAs that generally have to be treated separately, uh, and then we've got uh, much, much larger RNAs, um, and this has uh, an implication for estimating the expression level of the RNAs because uh, a large RNA is going to be detected more simply by virtue of the fact that it's larger. So there are more reads that are going to come from that RNA because it's a big thing. Uh, a small gene uh, will be harder to cover because it's a small, there's less reads that can come out of it. Uh, 
if you have large genes, uh, you can often encounter the problem where if you're doing a poly A selection, you can introduce 3 prime n bias. So if every gene has, that you're interested in has a poly A tail, and you grab onto that poly A tail during the preparation of your library, and then you wash everything else away while you're holding onto the poly A tail, which is at the 3 prime end, if any of your RNAs have been broken uh, or degraded, you're going to wash away the 5 prime ends of those things while you're holding onto the 3 prime end, and then you're going to sequence that uh, stuff that you're holding on to, and you're going to lose information from the 5 prime end. So if you look at the distribution of coverage across all of your transcripts from the 5 prime end to the 3 prime end, you're going to see this bias towards the 3 prime end, where you're really able to sequence the 3 prime end of your gene, but the 5 prime end basically is sort of an information hole. Um, yeah. Actually, well, I've got a different question, but so is there a way to compensate for I mean, you can compensate in the sense of dealing with maybe bias that introduces to gene expression levels, but if you're losing that information, it's just lost. Um, there's not a lot you can do uh, to recover so like that information. Way of saying the three prime is overrepresented, so we're going to ignore those, not ignore those regions, but downplay those regions as more prime. Yeah, I mean, again, you can do that kind of thing for gene expression purposes. But if you're interested in what is the sequence content of the 5 prime end of the gene, or how are exons connected to each other at the 5 prime end of the gene, if you don't have that information, there's just nothing you can do about that. So my original question was, is there any evidence for base composition bias? So if you have a very rich uh, transcript, is that going to hinder seemingly Yes. So the answer to your, is yes. Um, there is definitely, so all of these sequencing technologies that are currently used on every one in the past as well are, were definitely def defined and optimized for a particular GC content. And this is just a choice that you have to make. Uh, and you try to design the technology in such a way that it isn't biased towards high GC or low GC sequences. But invariably there is some amount of bias. Uh, and generally things that are very GC rich or very AT rich will not be sequenced as effectively. Uh, and there are other uh, features of the sequence that will influence, that will introduce bias, uh, such as re repeat content, uh, the propensity for those sequences to form secondary structures versus those that do not, uh, and so forth. So it's definitely another caveat to keep in mind that you know, there are a lot of sort of potential sources of bias uh, in this whole process. Is there a way to know the quality? There are many, many ways to assess the possible quality of your RNA-seq data, and we're going to talk about some of those. Um, it's complicated to come up with sort of one simple answer. Yes, this is a high quality library or no, it is not. It, to some degree, it depends on what you, what questions you hope to ask of the data. Um, but yes, there are many ways, many metrics that you can gather that will especially allow you to compare in a relative sense that this library was a failure for some reason compared to this other library, which looks much nicer. Um, and so some examples of that would be um, the degree the proportion of your reads that actually map to real known transcripts versus those that don't, the proportion of reads that map to introns uh, versus those that map to exons, uh, the proportion of reads that map across exon-exon junctions. Um, these tend to be good uh, estimates of a good rna library. Um, the, so we mentioned the end bias already, so a lot of people will generate these end bias plots and they'll look for nice even coverage from the 5 prime end to the 3 prime end of the transcript. Um, and so there are many other things like this too. Yeah, so we're running out of time. Um, we're going to take a break at 10.30. Okay. Something I also alluded to already is that RNA is very fragile compared to DNA. It's e easily degraded. Uh, something that you'll see a lot of are these uh, Agilent traces, or maybe you won't see the trace, but you'll uh, hear about uh, RNA integrity numbers. This is a very, very common way to assess the quality of RNA before performing RNA sequencing on it. 
uh, was to run it on uh, an Agilent um, lab on a chip assay. Uh, and basically what you're doing is, uh, effectively you're running a gel through a capillary and then you're getting a readout uh, of the nucleic acid sizes and the proportion of things that are each size. So this is a, a human RNA sample uh, that's incredibly intact. Uh, and when you run it through this assay, you get two large peaks for the ribosomal RNA species. Uh, and based on the, so the size um, and cleanness of these peaks, a, a score is assigned to this RNA sample. So this is total RNA. Um, and that's why you see so much uh, of these two ribosomal RNA peaks. Uh, this sample is assigned a score of 10, which is perfect. Uh, according to the algorithm. Uh, as your RNA sample gets degraded, uh, these two ribosomal RNA species start to become broken into smaller pieces, and then instead of getting two large peaks, you get a series of smaller peaks, and the more degraded the sample is, the more of these smaller peaks you get, uh, and gradually your sample starts to become more and more shifted towards smaller and smaller RNAs, uh, and the RNA integrity number gets lower and lower to reflect that level of degradation. Uh, and if your sample is heavily degraded, uh, that will definitely cause problems for your uh, RNA analysis. Some design considerations, just sort of overall for RNA sequencing. Uh, the ONCODE consortium a number of years ago came up with a, uh, basically formed a committee and came up with a bunch of uh, recommendations for how to do RNA sequencing. Uh, we provided this, the report that they wrote with, on the course wiki. Uh, and basically it covers things like what kind of metadata should you supply, how many replicates should you use, what kind of sequencing depth should you do, what control experiments should you include, uh, so that would be things like spike-ins, what standards should you use for reporting the data, uh, and so forth. It's a really uh, a good read to sort of get you, give you an idea of what the ideal experiment that you should aim for would look like. So I've sort of alluded to this as well, we could probably, you know, talk a lot about the details of these uh, points on this slide, uh, but just to quickly review some of them, um, there are many RNA-seq library construction strategies, and there really isn't a lot of agreement uh, in the field about how you should make an RNA-seq library. Uh, and to some degree, it really depends on what your experimental goals are, and that's why it's difficult to standardize. Uh, but it's also uh, not standardized because uh, it's still being improved. The early kits were really not that great, and we've gradually uh, they've been improved over time. So some, some of the major choices that are made by these kits are should you do sequencing of total RNA or should you do a poly A selection and then sequence that poly A enriched material? Uh, or an alternate to that might be to do a ribo reduction. So you start with total RNA and you try to pull away uh, or remove all the ribosomal RNA species. Uh, size selection. Uh, so you might, uh, I've already mentioned, divide your RNA into really small RNA, RNAs and then everything larger. Uh, and then once you make your CDN, cDNA, you might decide, decide to choose a very tight size fraction so that all of your fragments are very close to the same size. Some people do not do that. Some people will just remove the small stuff and then they have sequence a very broad range of sizes. So you have these paired 100 MERS coming from your fragments, and the fragments are anything from 100 bases in size to 500, 600, 700, or bigger. Uh, and that both of those things can have, uh, both those strategies can have imp uh, implications for your analysis. Uh, some kits use a linear amplification to try to deal with small RNA amounts. So they'll add a linker to the RNA uh, sequence, and then they'll use uh, some kind of polymerase to try to increase copy number so that you can start with a really small, absolute uh, amount of RNA as your input. Uh, initially, almost every RNA-seq library uh, was unstranded in that uh, you couldn't tell where the sequence, you, which strand the sequence you're sequencing came from. Uh, so RNAs are only expressed uh, in a five prime to three prime direction on one strand at one position. Uh, so it would, generally, it's nice to know which strand your RNA was expressed from uh, but many of the kits basically create double-stranded cDNA, and that's what you sequence. So you don't actually know for sure which strand was being expressed. You just have to infer it based on what you know about the annotation of that genome. But now there are libraries where this information is maintained, where you do know what strand the sequence came from. Uh, and if you can do that, I would definitely recommend that. Uh, Obi mentioned already that some people do exome capture uh, of their RNA-seq libraries to enrich for sequences that uh, come from 
real transcripts, real known transcripts. There are library normalization strategies that attempt to deal with this problem that you have very, very highly expressed genes that try to that tend to burn up all of your data, and then you have really lowly expressed genes that are hard to sequence. Uh, so library normalization tries to sort of flatten that out so that everything is a bit more even. And all of these things can really influence uh, both the analysis strategy you take and the interpretation of the results that you get out of your analysis. It's, and there, it's especially important to remember that if you're doing comparisons between libraries, you don't want to vary any of these things. It's just not a good idea. So you don't want to like make your libraries for your you know, condition A with one approach and then condition B, you decide, oh, I want to try this kit or this time I'm going to do poly A selection. And then you're hoping to make some biological insight about comparing condition A to condition B. And you're just going to wind up observing the differences between the way you treated your libraries and uh, the biology will potentially be lost. Replicates. A lot of questions come up about replicates. How many replicates should I do? What kind of replicates? Um, the good news is that the first category of replicates, technical replicates, this problem has largely been solved. Uh, so people used to do multiple uh, lanes from the same library or they would run the same library on two different flow cells or two different instruments. Um, if you're using the Illumina platform, this platform is so consistent that you really do not need to bother doing that anymore. Uh, you can basically treat them as identical. Um, so, for example, this is a, a plot of gene expression estimates that came from uh, data generated on one flow cell, one lane of one instrument, and then the same library was just loaded on a different instrument on a different lane, uh, and you basically get the same answer out of those two things. Uh, so it's very consistent, this platform, the Illumina platform. Of course, biological replicates, this is not the case. You should, of course, do biological replicates if you can, uh, if they're available. And these could be lots of different things, depending on what the nature of your experiment is. So some of the common analysis goals of RNA sequence analysis. Um, so there are many different things that you can ask of the data. Some of the more common things are listed here. Probably the most common is what we're going to start with, which is gene expression and differential expression. So this is conceptually very similar to microanalysis that's been done for years. Um, alternative expression analysis is sort of an extension of that. So not just how much is, a, is ex, what is the ex, gene expression output from a locus, but what are the transcripts that are actually being expressed from that locus. Uh, sort of related is transcript discovery and annotation. Uh, so since we're sequencing in a relatively unbiased way, we have the opportunity to discover entirely novel transcripts from potentially entirely novel genes. Uh, you can look at the, in diploid species, at allele specific expression. So you might see bias towards expression of a paternal or maternal allele, for example. Uh, some people attempt to do mutation discovery in RNA sequencing, RNA seq data. It's very difficult, but it is possible. Uh, in cancer, fusion detection is a very hot topic. Uh, and then RNA editing would be the attempt to find uh, sequence uh, differences at the RNA level that are not actually at the DNA level that occur after uh, transcription uh, of the RNA from the DNA. Some of the general themes of RNA-seq workflows. So each type of RNA-seq analysis has really distinct requirements and challenges, but there's generally also a common theme and they kind of follow this pattern. So we're going to have some raw data, a FASTQ file, a BAM file uh, that comes off the instrument. Uh, we're always going to align uh, or assemble uh, that data. Uh, and then we're going to process these alignments with, some, uh, with a series of tools. And usually there's a tool specific to various goals. So for example, we're going to use cufflinks for expression analysis. And we might use a tool like Diffuse or Chimera Scan for fusion detection. So each of the sort of goals that I listed in the last slide has usually many, many tools for that goal. And then usually there'll be each of these tools will dump out some potentially very complicated and obtuse uh, file formats, which you will then import into some downstream software to help you visualize, summarize, perform statistics, uh, really try to ask the biological question that you were initially interested in. Uh, and then you will, from that uh, summary, uh, create figures, gene lists, prioritize candidates for experimental validation, and so forth. Uh, the tool recommendation, so the details of this aren't really important. This is just a reference for you guys. Um, and I cover a few of the topic areas, but if you, if you want particular uh, recommendations for other areas, then uh, we can talk about that uh, during one of the coffee breaks. Uh, I would also recommend uh, visiting uh, these forums to uh, 
keep on top of uh, the latest developments in RNA-seq analysis or to look for a tool for your specific problem. Um, we're running low on time, but usually we would do a seek answers uh, exercise here. Um, but you can really just check this out on your own time. Uh, it's a really useful form, and particular seek answers is good for sort of more of the wet lab experimental questions related to RNA-seq. There's an incredible amount of information from people who've been really dealing with the problems of RNA-seq analysis uh, over the years. Yeah, so it's up to you. We can, you guys, we can continue um, the last several slides of this after a break, or we can just finish them off now, and then we can go right into the tutorial uh, after a break. So if we Oh. Great. Okay. Okay. You. I will try not to take too long to finish it off. Um, so a few common questions that these really relate specifically to the analysis. Um, the first uh, question that comes up for a, lot, for a lot of people that have done uh, DNA seq analysis that are moving into RNA seq is should I remove duplicates? And some people just assume yes, I should because I would always do that if I was doing uh, generating genome sequence data. Uh, but this is really a much more complicated question for RNA than it is for DNA. Uh, so the reason people remove duplicates in DNA is that uh, the assumption is that they might be from PCR amplification artifacts. So you're getting the same fragment being sequenced over and over again. And that was introduced during some PCR amplification step when you were making the library. And that really is a real concern. Uh, and you want to remove those because the information is not really, it's not... Uh, uh, telling you about un unique fragments. You basically just have one unique fragment and then you've got many copies of it. And what you really care about are the unique fragments. Uh, in RNA, we can't really do this because, um, because of the problems that I mentioned before, uh, that RNAs can be different sizes uh, and they can be expressed at different levels. So you can imagine a small gene that's very, very highly expressed. So say you'll have a gene that's only 400 bases in size and it's very highly expressed. There just isn't that many unique fragments that you can generate from that small RNA species. So you expect duplicates. Uh, even without PCR amplification artifacts, you expect a lot of duplicates from that, the output of that locus, and there's nothing you can do about that. So if you remove, if you remove your duplicates, you're basically going to remove your ability to, to, tell, to tell that that small, highly expressed RNA was really highly expressed. So generally, we don't remove or mark duplicates in RNA-seq analysis. Uh, how much library depth is needed? Every year, various people ask this question, um, and unfortunately, there isn't really a simple one-number answer. Uh, it really depends on a number of factors. Uh, so the first obvious one is uh, the size of the genome of the species you're studying uh, and the complexity of its transcriptome, uh, but also, to a large degree, what question you're asking of the data. So if you just want gene expression estimates that are very based much comparable to microarray uh, output that you would get, uh, that places the least demand on sequencing depth. So you can probably take four, five, six samples and multiplex them on a single lane of Illumina data and get gene expression estimates that are just fine. Um, the problem comes when you start to do ask more elaborate and detailed questions of the data. So not just how much, how abundant is each gene, but what is the structure of the isoforms of that gene? Uh, and what uh, mutations are expressed or not expressed, uh, or mutation calling, all of these things mean that you need to have a much more comprehensive uh, view of the transcriptome to answer these questions well. It can also really vary depending on tissue type, um, RNA preparation method, the quality of your RNA, the library construction method. Um, to some degree, it can depend on what kind of sequencing you're doing. So how long are your reads? Are you doing paired versus unpaired reads? Uh, and then to a lesser degree, what computational approach and resources you have at your disposal. Uh, probably the best thing you can do if you, you want to design your experiment, decide how much depth is to find an experiment that's somehow similar to what you want to do and see what they did as a kind of starting point, then conduct a pilot experiment uh, and kind of overkill the data or what you think is an overkill and see how it turns out and try to get a sense from that where you should set the bar. 
Uh, and of course, there are things like budget that will put sort of hard constraints on the amount of data that you can generate. Yeah. How does a xenograph sample, a uh, human xenograph? Yeah, I guess that's what it meant. So the, you're sequencing the human transcriptome at yeah. that point. I don't see, I mean, you can, I have seen some xenograph experiments where you tend to get good RNA quality because it's, it's a fairly controlled experiment. You have a lot of control over when and how RNA is isolated. It's not like a tumor coming from a, an individual in the operating room where it sits you know, at room temperature. Uh, so your RNA quality might be higher than it would be, and that is definitely in your favor. Um, but I would say in that case, it's still probably the bigger factors are gonna be what do you hope to do with the data as opposed to where it came from in that case. So, you know, we can maybe talk about what your experimental goals are in more detail if you want. Maybe you have to deal with mouse contamination as well. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And that, yeah, so if you have a lot of mouse contamination, then those are reads that you're, in effect, wasting because, you know, you're not, you're interested in the, the xenograph, not the host. So it's So you need 10% more data than you would need. Uh, so th the good news in all of this is that the, the output of the high seq instrument is, is so vast now that one to two lanes of data is a lot. And you can do most of what you would want to do with that. Um, so that's sort of the, the simple answer uh, if, if you really want one. Um, some common strategies. Um, or another common question is what mapping strategy should you use? Uh, and this, this has also really been simplified. So it used to be that we had this problem where it really depended on read length. So there was a lot of people generating data where you had really, really short reads that were shorter than 50 bases, 36, 42, that kind of thing. And those short reads are really difficult to align and they're difficult to align in a manner that uh, identifies splice sites. Um, so you would generally take a different approach with those small reads where you'd align to a genome and junction database or directly to the transcriptome um, or you might try an assembly strategy and then try to align contigs. Uh, but now most people are generating uh, much larger reads than that so instead of 50 bases or smaller they're usually 100 or paired 100 MERS and then you should really use a splice aware aligner like Bowtie Top Hat which is what we're going to use. Uh, visualization of splice. Um, I, it's pretty comparable to BWA in terms of speed. We mostly use it just because that's what top, the Top Hat authors chose to use as their short read aligner. So Top Hat is really like uh, a heuristic or a series of heuristics that are built on top of bow tie align alignments. And, but you could, in theory, switch bow tie for BWA and it would probably work fairly well. Um, it's just, you know, the authors of Top Hat, they wrote bow tie and so they, that's what they used. But that you can, to some degree, you know, s swap them. Yeah, there are a lot of different strategies. That's just one example of literally dozens of different um, al alignment, uh, isoform assembly, and quantification pipelines. Um, we chose we choose this one because uh, we have a lot of experience with it and it's the most popular and it's one of the better engineered in terms of the software. Um, 
but it's not necessarily the best or the only option. Um, in the lab, actually, we have a parallel optional, which is using different aligner stars and a top hat, and using a totally different expression estimation and differential expression. Not actually using the same expression estimation, but a different differential expression approach. But you showed me two. Like, yes. Yeah, so. The idea here is really to try to give you a good example of uh, what one of these pipelines look like uh, and get you comfortable with it. And hopefully you can use that, do it exactly the way we do it here, but, or you can you know, use a different approach. And, but there will be very, a lot of common themes. So the concept will be almost exactly the same and you'll just be using different tools and different commands. Uh, we can't cover every possibility, but the hope is that this example is demonstrative enough that you can go around and play with an alternate strategy um, using the skills that you've learned here. Um, I would have to check. Yeah, like I say, there's a lot. There are literally like 20 different. <laughs> Um, I think that we have some slides that show like all of these different things, but we would have to dig into the details of it to really understand exactly how it differed. Um, so we're going to look at uh, a, a lot of IGB uh, screenshots and we're going to look at IGB sessions ourselves. Uh, this is just an example of an, a visualization of some RNA-seq data. Uh, actually, this is whole genome sequence data at the top here. So what's being shown here is, as you can see, nice even coverage. So each of these gray bars is a single read. Uh, and the little colored lines are discrepancies between the alignment of that read and the reference genome, which is shown at the bottom here. Um, uh, and this is for a normal sample, uh, and this is from a tumor sample, uh, and you can see the coverage bar at the top here. You see nice even coverage uh, across in both cases. Uh, you can see here that there's a, a polymorphism where you've got a heterozygous SNP, uh, and then you can see here an example of a mutation that's in the tumor, but not in the normal. So this is a somatic mutation. Uh, and it turns out that this somatic mutation is at the edge of the exon of a known gene. Uh, and it's actually an acceptor site mutation. Uh, and then this track is the RNA-seq read, or the RNA-seq track. So now notice how the coverage uh, is much more blocky, where you've got high coverage uh, on the exons and then much lower coverage in the introns. Uh, and then when you look at the individual reads, uh, the reads are spanning across exon uh, intron boundaries. So this, for example, this read covers the end of this exon, uh, and then it continues on uh, at the beginning of this exon with the intron sequence being skipped. Uh, and then these three reads that are uh, marked uh, with stars are actually showing the skipping of this uh, middle exon uh, and a join of this exon directly to that one, uh, which is exactly what we would predict to be the effect of a splice site mutation at the acceptor site. Uh, of this gene. So basically the splicing machinery is no longer able to uh, recognize this site, so it skips this exon and you get a transcript that's connecting uh, exon 1 to exon 3 here. Make sense? Uh, and then this is sort of the last common question, um, which is probably asked less now than it used to be, but basically how reliable are RNA-seq express expression predictions? Um, Things like, are the novel exon-exon junctions that I'm seeing in my data real, or are they just some kind of artifact of alignment or the sequence data production? Uh, if we went to try to validate these things, how many of them would validate? Uh, and sort of similar question for the differential expression level. So if we find it to be a gene or an exon or an exon junction to be differentially expressed between uh, condition A and condition B, is that real? Is it comparable to a microarray output or to qPCR, something that you might be more familiar with? So to try to address this question a number of years ago, I did a, a series of uh, validation experiments uh, where we compared uh, output from RNA-seq to microarrays and also to qPCR, RT-PCR, Sanger sequencing, and so forth. Uh, and you can read all about the details of that in the, the paper that was cited there. Um, but basically what we did is two validation experiments. Uh, in one case, we looked at examples kind of like the one I just showed in the IGB screenshot where we had a prediction from RNA-seq that said there's a novel exon skipping event going on here. So I'm expecting to see exon 1, 2, 3, 
but my RNA-seq data is telling me that exon 2 is actually skipped uh, or alternatively spliced. Uh, so we designed PCR primers to uh, span across exon 1 and 3, uh, and then based on whether the exon is included or excluded, we expect different bands. So we get a large band if exon 2 is there and a smaller band if exon 3, 2 is skipped. Uh, and we expect the, the size difference to be the size of exon 2 and that both of these will be at the expected sizes. Uh, if we then cut these bands out of, out of the gel uh, and purify the DNA, uh, cDNA, sequence it, uh, we, we could val validate by Sanger sequencing that indeed the exon was skipped. So that's what's being shown here. We've got exon 1, 2, 3, and the second exon is being skipped. Uh, so we did this about 200 times. And we basically assessed how long, how often did RNA-seq tell us the, the right thing. Uh, and we got a validation rate of about 85%, uh, which is probably a lower limit because sometimes it's the PCR experiment that fails and actually the RNA-seq was right. Which is probably closer to 90, 95%. Uh, and you see a very similar story for the expression level or differential expression analysis where, again, we found cases where the RNA-seq told us that a particular exon was being differentially expressed or differentially spliced or had a, a different uh, boundary. Uh, and we got uh, on the y-axis here uh, differential expression estimates between two conditions, so drug treated and untreated, for example. Uh, and then we compared the output of that to a comparable output from a qPCR experiment where we designed exon-specific primers and did uh, a very classic qPCR experiment. Uh, and then we did this with replicates and we assessed whether qPCR also found that exon to be differentially expressed. Uh, and we got a validation rate of 88%. And again, that is probably a lower estimate that's probably closer to 90, 95%. Uh, and then there, again, there's another exercise that we can do here, um, maybe after the break or, or later, you can do this on your own, where uh, basically you do a quick tour of the Biostar websites. This is a really great forum for uh, asking and answering questions about bioinformatics. And there's a lot of people in the RNAC community that participate in this forum. Uh, including myself and Obi. Uh, how many people here have used Biostar or Biostar members? Okay, so about a third or a quarter of you. So I highly recommend that the, the rest of you during this course sign up for accounts there uh, and just do some quick searches for the kinds of analysis you're doing or experimental conditions you're interested in just to get a quick sense of uh, how, much, how many of your questions might have already been answered there. Um, and when you have problems in the future, you can direct questions there. So that's the end um, of this lecture, and we'll continue on after the break. So, let's take so the first thing I want to do um, is just do the, show this sort of really high-level uh, flow chart of everything we're going to be covering um, in the tutorials over the next two days. Um, so everything is going to start with... Uh, some sort of fundamental inputs, which are listed here on the bottom and at the left. So we've got raw sequence data, uh, and these are going to be FASTQ files, which is sort of a, a very common file format for Illumina sequence data and other types of next-gen sequence data. Uh, and in our case, these are uh, paired 2 by 100 base pair RNA-seq reads. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about some of the other inputs that are really important to this kind of analysis. Uh, so one of which we've talked about already, which is the reference genome. Uh, and we've learned that having a reference genome versus not having it can have a, a pretty pronounced effect on uh, the way you do your analysis. Uh, and then a, a sort of related input is gene annotations. So depending on your species, you will hopefully have some uh, notion of gene annotation for that species. Uh, and it'll be more or less complete depending on how well and how long that species has been studied. For things like human, the gene annotation is exceptionally good. So an incredible amount of resources have been poured into understanding where genes are in the human genome what the, and what they look like uh, and what their possible functions might be, how they're similar or different from other genes, what classes they belong to, and so forth. Uh, and each of these things has sort of common file formats. Uh, I already mentioned FASTQ. Uh, reference genomes are often represented in FASTA file format. Uh, and then there are many formats for gene annotation, but one of the more common is ETF. Uh, and we're going to review all of these file formats uh, so that you know what you're looking at when you look at the raw data. The way our analysis is going to flow is basically we'll start with our raw data, our raw read data, 
and we're going to do alignments of those reads to a reference genome using uh, Top Hat, uh, which, as I've already mentioned, is kind of a, a pile of heuristics uh, stacked on top of a bow tie, which is really the fundamental aligner uh, that's used. Uh, once we have our alignments, we're going to have BAM files, which is another common file format. We're going to dig into what that, how that file format works as well. Uh, and this file is going to be fed into Cufflinks, which is going to try to compile or uh, assemble transcripts from uh, our individual read alignments. Uh, and then we're going to compare those transcripts to the known transcripts for human uh, that are represented in our DTF file uh, using a tool called Cufflinks. Uh, and then we're going to compare our two conditions. So remember, we have a tumor and a normal sample from uh, colon tissue uh, using cuff diff. Uh, and then we're going to use uh, cummerbund uh, to do some visualization and statistics. Uh, and then there will also be some sort of custom uh, R scripts that we'll introduce you to as well. Uh, so you can see by the naming of these things that they're all named after articles of clothing, uh, which is kind of the cutesy theme that the authors of this suite of tools chose, uh, and they call it the Tuxedo Suite. Uh, so what we're going to start with is really uh, talking about these input files. That's really going to be the meat of Module 1. So before we jump into actually running commands, I have a few slides that actually introduce some of the terminology of the tutorial itself. Uh, so each tutorial has this corresponding series of slides that try to provide some definitions. Uh, and you can kind of follow the, along with these as we're doing the actual tutorial, running actual commands in your terminal. But I'm just going to go through them quickly so that it's, uh, you get kind of a heads up and you're familiar. So learning objectives of this tutorial, we're going to go through uh, installation. Uh, installation is painful and tedious, but it's really a part of bioinformatics. Uh, and it's pretty hard to get around doing it, so we're going to try to get you familiar with how to install these tools. Uh, we're going to talk about how to obtain a reference genome, uh, how to obtain gene transcript annotations for that genome. We'll look at the GTF file format uh, and how that works. Uh, we're going to index our reference genome for use uh, with the aligners. This is a common theme of basically all of the next-gen aligners that you build an index, which is sort of like uh, it's basically like uh, an index in a library where you have a, a card catalog that tells you where all the books go in the library. Uh, this index uh, is a, basically a way of organizing the information in the reference genome to allow us to search for things in it more rapidly. Uh, and then we're going to look at some of the raw sequence data uh, that we're going to be doing our alignments with. We'll look at the, these FASTA and FASTQ files. Uh, these are some of the most common problems that are encountered while working on the tutorials. Um, there's sort of a, a challenge that we have that some of these commands are really, really long and elaborate. Uh, and from a learning perspective, it would, all, it would be better if everyone was able to type these out, really think about everything that's going on. Um, but from a sort of time constraint uh, perspective, it's just not possible to get through all the analysis if we have to type these really, really long, elaborate commands. So what we usually recommend is that for some of the shorter commands, uh, you can try typing them carefully if you like, but make sure you're always doing things in order and that you're not skipping steps. Uh, otherwise, you can you know, quickly get to a spot where it's, you know, it's like you're taking directions and you take a, a wrong turn early on, and by the time you get to the end of the directions, you're in a completely wrong place to where you're meant to be. Um, so watch out for that. Uh, so we're going to be doing, for elite, uh, especially for the long or medium length commands, we're going to do copying and pasting. So get familiar with how you copy from the tutorial file into your terminal, uh, which will differ slightly depending on whether you're on a Mac or a PC or a Linux. Um, but make sure that you've uh, got the hang of that. Uh, it's a lot faster if you learn the shortcuts for that, for copying and pasting if you don't know them already. Make sure you copy the entire command. So sometimes the commands are so long that they wouldn't fit on one line. They wrap over to the next line. Uh, you got to get all of, all of that command pasted in together. Um, another problem that's common is being in the wrong directory at the wrong time. So we're going to be doing things like create files, rename files, move files, concatenate files. Uh, and a lot of the commands uh, assume that you're in, a in the directory you're supposed to be in. So if you start moving around and then you try to continue on, uh, the commands might not work because you're not in the place that you're supposed to be. Um, 
So watch out for that. Uh, if you do change directories, just make sure you go back to where you were before continuing on with the rest of the uh, tutorial. Uh, we have this RNA home environment variable set. Uh, and we'll go over that with you one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, we always want to make sure that this thing is defined. Uh, I think it might have been added to the bash RC file so that you don't have to worry about it. Is that correct, Obi? Sorry. Do you know if this RNA home environment variable is added to the bash RC already? Uh, we're going to do that. Oh, okay. So there's a number of tutorial files. Uh, and they're all available on the wiki. Uh, we're going to start with this first one called Tutorial Module 1 uh, Linux.txt, and it's called Linux because we're doing this in a Linux environment. Uh, so we're going to be on the cloud in an Ubuntu uh, instance, which is a type of Linux. We're going to do a really simple introduction to Linux and basic commands. Then we're going to install the tools, obtain the reference genome, create our index, obtain and explore some gene annotations, and then obtain and explore some raw RNA-seq data. Uh, each of these files um, contains much more complete instructions than what's sort of briefly summarized here. Um, lines in the tutorial file that begin with the, the hash sign are comments, so you can paste these into the terminal and nothing happens. They're just there to help explain what's going on. Uh, all, of, all of the other lines are things that should be pasted and executed in the Linux terminal, or in the case of some of these tutorials are going to be done in R, then it'll happen in an R tutorial instead of a Linux tutorial. Um, each command, we try to annotate them with comments that explain what's going on, but we do assume a basic familiarity with Linux. Uh, so we assume that you know how to make a directory and change directories. Uh, and we're going to walk you through that process, but all of this will go a lot more smoothly for those of you that are already familiar with Linux or that did the, the pre-workshop uh, exercise. <coughs> These are the tools we're going to install. Uh, we don't really need to read those, it's just for reference. Um, so when we obtain our reference genome, there's various places you can obtain them from. We're going to get them from the Illumina iGenomes project. And this is just a project that attempts to kind of like uh, simplify uh, obtaining these files to get you going on your analysis faster. They've sort of uh, done some organizing for us. Um, we are going to use uh, only a single chromosome of the human genome. Uh, and this, the reason for this is just to reduce the runtime for the tutorial. So in reality, you would not do that if you were studying human RNA-seq data. You would want, want to align to the whole genome. But it's just too, it takes too much time because it's such a huge search space. So even with a, a small toy sort of amount of reads, it would take too long. Uh, so we use a single chromosome. But we provide instructions for how you would do it if you were using the whole genome. A uh, similar idea with the transcript annotations. So we're getting them again from the Illumina iGenomes project. The link is there. Uh, there are lots of other places to get gene annotations. And there are various competing uh, and collaborating entities that are annotating the human genome. And it's a similar situation for many other genomes or species. Uh, we're going to download GTF files, in this case describing human transcripts. So these contain things like exon coordinates, uh, gene identifiers, gene symbols like BRCA1 and EGFR. Uh, and we're going to talk about the GTF file, but it's described in, in gory detail at, at this link here if you want to go and read more about that on your own time. Uh, before, uh, so I mentioned this already, before sequences can be mapped to the genome, that gene reference genome has to be indexed. Uh, and this has to be done in a way that's compatible with the aligner being used. So each aligner will come with a little tool that helps you index the genome for use with that aligner. Uh, and this is sort of, sort of another common bioinformatics mistake that people commonly run into is that they index the reference genome and then they use a different aligner or they update their aligner and the index is no longer compatible. Uh, and that can either cause errors which may or may not be clear or it can cause your alignments to not uh, come out correctly. <coughs> we're going to use uh, Top Hat, uh, but we're also going to as use an, uh, an alternate aligner called STAR uh, and each of these require their own. Uh, index of the reference genome. So we have some test data that we're going to use uh, for the purposes of the tutorial. It's kind of been pre-filtered to make things uh, come out faster and nicer. Uh, so basically what we did is identified reads that matched to transcripts on a single chromosome. So we've sort of stacked the deck so that we're not wasting our time aligning reads to a part of the genome that we're not going to look at. We're going to focus on chromosome 22 or whatever it was we chose, and we've already picked reads that we know align to chromosome 22. Uh, 
Uh, again, this is just for the purposes of making the tutorial uh, run more quickly. And it, it still takes time. You're still going to be waiting for analysis to happen. Um, the test data consists of two RNAs. So we've got human colon tumor and matching normal. Each RNA was used to create four different libraries. So there's uh, cDNA that was prepared one way, that's called cDNA1, uh, and cDNA that was pre prepared another way called cDNA2, and then replicate libraries were made from each of these cDNAs, so we've got library one and library two. So again, this is just to kind of simulate a very simple sort of biological experiment where you've got condition A, condition B, replicate one, replicate two. Uh, you might have more conditions, you might have more replicates, uh, but it's just sort of to have the sort of familiar theme. Uh, the input data is provided in FASTQ format, uh, which is an example as shown here. So in the FASTQ format, every record consists of four uh, lines, uh, and they always uh, start have the same pattern, which is they start with the at symbol, followed by the read name, which is this very long, complicated sounding thing. Uh, and there's actually a fair amount of information uh, in this. This will often contain some kind of identifier of the instrument that did the sequencer, sequencing, uh, some kind of unique uh, number, uh, and then these numbers describe the position uh, of the read. Uh, so in this case, the read came from lane 3, uh, sector 61, uh, xy coordinates uh, of these two numbers. So it's actually telling you where physically on the flow cell that read was generated from. Uh, and then so this is sort of optional, but there'll be a slash one to tell you that this is read one of a read pair, and then slash two would be read two of the same read pair. So those will have exactly the same read name, but it'll just be slash one or slash two. This is the actual read sequence. Um, and then the third line is a, a plus, uh, which is just kind of a delimiter. Uh, and then this fourth line uh, are the quality values associated with each uh, sequence in the read. Uh, and they're represented in a kind of code where each letter corresponds to a number, and that number tells you how confident you should be that that base was called correctly or incorrectly. Uh, and you can convert these letters uh, back to the numbers, and the number can uh, be converted to a probability that the read was correct at that position. Uh, and we'll p talk more about uh, the details of that as well. <clears throat> So as I said, each library is marked as cDNA1 or cDNA2 and either library replicate 1 or library replicate 2. Uh, cDNA1, in case you're interested, was a total RNA library and cDNA2 was a library that was poly-A selected, but this starting with the same RNA. Uh, and then the two replicate libraries are kind of slightly different strategies. One was sort of standard RNA sequencing and the other one was where we did a cDNA capture of the RNA-seq library uh, using a, an exome reagent to try to enrich four uh, reads that align to real genes. Um, I think I've covered all the rest of this. Uh, so we have four samples in total. So you're going to see a lot of cases in the tutorial where we do a command on the first piece of data and then we do it three more times. So you'll have these series of four commands where we're going to do something to each of the four pieces of data that we're working with. Uh, we're going to do a quick pre-alignment QC with uh, this tool called FastQC. Uh, and this is a tool that basically you load a FastA or FastQ file and it produces a report uh, describing features of that uh, RNA data. Uh, and it can be used to identify problems with the data, give you an idea of how good the quality of your RNA-seq library is before you get too deep into the analysis. 